Now that you're recording, uh, you can see that I actually used the original front slide. Um, that must be enough. So we're, we're switching to the real slide deck. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, you guys probably figured out uh, that this is a future that kind of looks nice, right? I mean, I, I chose a picture that is certainly post-apocalyptic, but it looks nice. So what does that mean? Well, we're probably looking into a good future. Uh, you, can, you can decide that on your own. So um, before we actually start, Java developers. Perfect, wow, that's awesome. Like the highest audience rate, I guess. Um, some is gun safe users. Okay, <laughs> two. Who used some is gun safe using some other framework in the past? Well, and the others are undecided. Uh, we'll figure that out. Okay, so what, what is some is gun safe? Just a quick question. It's an internal API. Are we supposed to use those kind of things? No. Okay. So that's important. This is not a bad talk. As I said, I chose a very, very nice picture, a good future, even though um, who kind of followed lap last year, uh, we're just going quickly through the history. Uh, it, was, it, it looked kind of weird. So um, that's me. Um, I chose the biggest picture that I kind of found. Uh, it's actually from my wedding. Um, so that's the reason why I'm just looking very nice. Um, I'm doing Java for, I think by now it's 12 or 13 years. So um, for quite a long time. Uh, at the moment, I'm working as manager of developer relations at Hazelcast. Uh, you kind of figured that out probably. Um, and most of the time, it's performance, garbage collection, whatever re is related to anything in terms of performance optimization. That's normally where I work or where my, my personal uh, favorite topics rely. So some is gun safe. Already said that. What is it? Well, there's a few words that come up if you search for it on the internet. Um, my personal favorite is unsafe. I, kind of, I think that's kind of obvious, right? Um, low level, platform specific, pointers. Java and pointers, that's not going to work well, right? Um, and the other one that's probably one of the nicest words is discourage. Don't, dis don't encourage anyone to use it. So if we would redesign it today, it would probably be sun miss scissors. And I think most of the guys or most of the people here know this term running with scissors because it's inherently dangerous. So, um, during this slide, or during the slide deck, there will be some kind of movie references. And I want to make this a small game. We don't have a lot of time, so we have to hurry up a bit, but uh, I still want to do it. What's that? A lot of the rings. Perfect. So as I said, it's an internal class of the JDK. We're not supposed to use those kind of things. And that is quite a long time uh, as a statement, um, good old Wayback Machine, um, we all love that. Uh, we didn't know what the internet looked like in 1989 if we don't have the Wayback Machine. Um, but even at that time, Sun told us, please don't do that kind of crap. It's not a good idea. It will probably change. It never did, but um, that's probably the reason by, because nobody cared. So there are some things in the JDK, or in some is gun safe, that we can do. And they are very interesting. Um, GC overhead. That's a common problem with Java applications, bigger Java applications. We can minimize it by doing custom memory allocation, custom memory layout. Um, we can have special memory fences. So whenever I want to update something, I want to make sure that it is visible to other threads. Things that normally work with volatile. Um, or synchronized, synchronized users here? Don't raise your hand, man. <sighs> you can do better. Um, fast deserialization, serialization in general. Um, there is almost like no serialization framework with, which doesn't use some misc unsafe. And my personal favorite, volatile semantics on array elements. Who knows what happens if I have an array and I mark this array as volatile? 
does that mean that all the, the inner elements of the area are volatile as well? No, it doesn't. Why? Because it's stupid. That's the only reason. Um, so when it, it only means the array reference itself is volatile. And that's certainly a problem for a lot of use cases. And there is, interestingly, a lot of applications or a lot of developers getting this wrong and expecting that if I change something in the array, the other threads will see that because I mark the array as volatile. It's probably one of the biggest mistakes from my personal point of view uh, in the Java memory model, not making the array itself or the array elements itself uh, volatile as well. So um, it's used a lot inside the JDK, and I mean quite a lot. Um, there is some unreadable code. There is some nicer code. Um, that is uh, the fork join pool uh, that was added in, what was it, Java 7, I think. Um, this, you probably figure out uh, this guy who wrote it comes from C++ or from the C world. There's some hints hidden in the source code that you might figure it out. Um, he's a pretty big guy in the, uh, in, in, in the Java and C++ world, Doug Lee. Um, it goes that far that some, somewhere in the source code, I don't remember where it actually was, I think in the, some of the thread pool executor, there's a comment, I don't understand why, but Doug probably is right about that. In Duck we trust. Next movie quote. That's probably Titanic. I just wanted to say it's probably more for the ladies, but you have little hair like me. <laughs> right, it's Titanic. So as I said, it's used quite a lot inside of the JDK. Uh, there's use cases outside of the JDK. Unfortunately, there are also bad ones. And um, I love that. That's probably the worst idea ever. Um, so he creates an object, and just to, to explain how it works, you, you uh, get unsafe, you allocate an object uh, of type player, uh, we see that how that works in a bit, and eventually he wants to free this object, right? We're in a C++ kind of world back, right? So how do I get the memory out pointer for this object? Well, maybe, maybe it is hash code. Who knows what hash code does? What is it? Right. Whatever it is, it's not a memory pointer. So what happens is, boom. And you can do this at home. Believe me, it's that easy. You can make it easier. I did it. Uh, you can use unsafe and, and write to memory position zero. Who understands what memory position zero means? It's a null pointer. You actually can have real null pointers in Java. You just need to do it. Um, the guy who found that, Mark Reynold, uh, the, the uh, Java lead, um, uh, platform lead, no, what is he? Uh, lead architect, Java lead architect, he found that and, and posted it last year, or f two years ago, on the Java Language Summit. Very interesting. OK, next one. You probably have a different one here as well. In Germany, it's different. Yes. If you find a long word, it's either Spring or Mary Poppins. It could be a Spring class name, probably. <laughs> so we're coming back to this question. Who uses a framework that uses some MISC unsafe? Um, we have a few here. It's not all. It's just like the most common ones. Uh, you have Hibernate, Spring, Drop Wizard, Easy Mock. Anyone using mocking frameworks? Perfect. Good call. Netty? Netty users, no Netty. Uh, Creo, serialization framework, JSON, or J J J whatever you're going to pronounce that. Google, Googleson. Yep. Cassandra, Hexacast, uh, EHCache, you can go forever. So the, the thing is, here's probably nobody in the room that doesn't have anything in his application stack that doesn't use some is unsafe, which is kind of weird, right? We have an, an internal API which is not supposed to be used. But we're all using it somehow. Right? I'm, I just had to do that for company reasons, right? Um, OK, Hexacast use cases. Um, obviously, we use it as well. We want to be fast. Sometimes it's the only way to really be fast. Um, and I just used our, our, our repository and, type, and searched for unsafe. 
I probably get like three or four comments. It's unsafe to do that. Um, but in general, it's most of the time real unsafe use cases. The interesting thing is we try to have a fallback for the situation where somebody has a security manager, doesn't allow unsafe. We're running on a platform which doesn't have unsafe, which probably doesn't exist. Well, they do exist, but um, not, not a lot. Not in the common world, let's say it that way. So what do we do? Um, as I said, GC overhead, uh, minimizing the GC overhead is like the most common thing. Um, that's where people normally uh, drop in. Uh, we want to have memory allocation in 64-bit. We store a lot of data in memory. That means we don't like this two gigabyte byte buffer kind of API thingy, which probably was a problem or was wrong already back when, when the API was designed. I mean, this API comes from Java 5, well, 1.5. Um, did anybody not expect 64-bit to be a thing in the next few years? No, right? They, they didn't at Sun at that point. Um, see, deserialization. So you see, we use like four of seven different use cases, and you probably can fit the other ones as well if you want to. Next one. That's an old movie. Oh, you're my movie hero, I see that. OK, as I said, hotspot, unsafe, right? JVMs need to support that. Um, and one of the common claims is that you can't use some is unsafe because not all of the, the implementations of the JVM support that. So I had some free time, right? Spare time, you know this. Um, that only happens when you're getting unemployed or something. Um, and I just looked through all the different JVM implementations I could find out there and that they're still actively maintained. And just to make sure, green means yes, it supports some MISC unsafe in most of the situations. And red means no, it doesn't. One of the red ones is, where is it? Um, uh, where's my favorite? Oh, Bika, Bika VM. Very nice JVM implementation, runs on JavaScript inside of your browser. I don't understand why they didn't implement memory allocation, right? But JavaScript, come on, a JavaScript-based JVM? That's, that's at least awesome, somehow. Um, you, so you can run Bika VM on Node.js running Java on JavaScript, <clears throat> whatever. Good. Come on. <laughs> you are amazing. Uh, we wanted to speed that up, so that's perfectly fine. So I have to read this. So um, that's from a mailing list. So this whole discussion around some is unsafe and how, what, what is going to happen with it started not exactly with that email, but it came to, to the common, common ground. So Donald Smith, an Oracle employee, uh, wrote this email on the OpenJFX mailing list. OpenJFX, the open source Java FX project. And OpenJFX uses a lot of SumISC Unsafe and other internal APIs. Um, so SumISC Unsafe is not the only thing. And Donald had a very, very straight opinion. He said, SumISC Unsafe must die in a fire, ignore any kind of theoretical rope, and start, a path to, uh, to, uh, start the path to Rises now. Kill unsafe, kill unsafe dad, kill unsafe right. That's a straight opinion. Um, he just used a lot of code, uh, a lot of code, a lot of text to, to make this happen. So I read this and it felt like, did they create some kind of a new task force? Like the kill unsafe to total death thingy? Right, no, something like that. Huh? I read it again and like, oh, there's actually an interesting sentence in this whole mass of, of text. And that is, this is the year to explain where the API is broken and get it straight. OK, uh, he could just write that. That makes sense. Makes perfect sense to me. So we took off at the JCP. So who knows the JCP, the Java community process? Perfect. Ah, you guys are awesome. And Hazelcast is part of the executive committee, um, which is the guys that vote on the specifications in the end. Um, and we brought this up in, in one of the EC meetings. And starting from that, we've, we, 
we uh, created an external working group uh, with a lot of different people working out where unsafe is used, what features is necessary, and where we need replacements. Um, and there are just some things, Hazelcast, Azul. Who knows Azul? Ah, that's awesome. Um, higher frequency trading? Peter Laurie? OK. Just forget everything I said about you guys. <laughs> so we had this long document explaining all the different use cases and, and why they are necessary. For example, on a mocking framework, you have to inject classes kind of things, right? And it turned out that Oracle actually listens to people. It was not really unexpected, but somehow. And there was one way of, or here's the official way of solving this issue. The official way is we create a replacement in version X. It will be deprecated. So the SunDisk unsafe internal API, whatever it is, will be deprecated in version X and will be removed in X plus one. Sounds like a fair deal, um, depending on how long Java releases take, right? We know everything between one year and nine years is possible. Um, so uh, Java 10, uh, I take guesses, I take bets. So Java 9 is coming out next year, which is 2017. Java 10, 2020, 2024. Who goes higher? Well, we, we definitely have a nice time frame to solve these issues feature by feature. So here is the, uh, the, the text, how to explain it. Um, you can put this in, in longer words, or you can just make it a mathematical formula, like x, x plus 1, done. But the whole thing is you don't simply remove it, because it's not possible. And that was where this whole thing started. So right, next movie quote. What? X-Men. You're not an X-Men fan. Uh, not the movies. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay, um, so now we're going through some of the problem statements. I'm just yeah, okay. Uh, through some of the problems that some is gonna save has, and some proposals how to solve those things, and. They're not only interesting if you use SunDisk Unsafe so far, they probably are interesting for something you have to build in the future. Because at that point, it is public API and it is designed to be used. Sounds good to me. But problem one, how do we get access at the moment? Well, there's an easy one, which unfortunately only works inside of the JVM or inside of the JDK for like 90% of the platforms at least. You can ask some is unsafe just for a single instance. Who figured out singletons are a good idea? Great. Even the C++ guys figured out singletons are not, not great, at least. They probably haven't figured out they are bad, but they're not great. So, well, we're not inside the JDK, so we have to find a different way. And that is, we, we've already seen something like that in the, in the Stack Overflow thingy before. Uh, we get the, the um, class field um, in most of the JVM implementations. The static final um, singleton is called the unsafe. It's like the Highlander. Um, you make it accessible. You guys know reflection, right? And then you just get it. Perfect. Just a single small problem. It doesn't work with security managers. And throw some meaningful arrow if it doesn't work, right? That's the most important thing. Just kill the application in the best case. So we have a bigger version, which works on like 99.9% .9 of, of the JVMs. We try, we try the first option. As I said, that works on some. Uh, there's a security check in most JVMs to make sure you don't do that. Uh, it goes down the, the call stack just to make sure you're running inside of the system class loader. Um, if that doesn't work, we're trying the unsafe. Unfortunately, Android or Google decided, no, the unsafe is too Highlander-like. We call it the one. So you just walk over all fields and figure out if you can cast something in this class to unsafe. Great, right? It's that easy. 
It's just that easy to get unsafe. And there's one more version, and I really like that. Um, who can figure out what that does? It creates a new, sing a new singleton, please, a new singleton instance. Right, it, creates, it just creates its own instance of unsafe. Works perfectly fine for obvious reasons. Who thinks singletons in Java are a great idea? Uh, we, we had this, right? So, yeah, he said singleton. Okay, the question is, does any of that feel right? And you guys already laughed, so no. It doesn't. Uh, I see some weird looks here. Uh, that is actually the, the restroom in our first office, well, this was the restroom in our first office in Palo Alto. Um, my my co or our co-founder co uh, posted that on Twitter and was like, where did you find that? And he was like, I just took this picture. And he tweeted it with parallel computing. Uh, perfect, right? Uh, by the way, there is just one door, the door is lockable, and obviously there are two things as well. <laughs> but that's not the only weird thing that can happen. It still doesn't feel better. <laughs> and that is the German fire department. Um, we, don't, we don't seem to have like the cleverest, smartest people. At least not always. Uh, but I mean, this works all the time, unfortunately, not in this case. Okay, so how do we get access? We don't need it. As I said, we get public APIs. We don't need to have any of this weird shit, uh, which is, from my perspective, the best thing ever. <sighs> okay, so atomic updates. Who knows what atomic updates mean? Feel free. Just <laughs> forget. It's okay. Um, so in this case, we use compare and swap. Compare and swap means we give an old value, we give a new value, and we get an atomic exchange when the old value is still valid. So this operation looks into the memory, does the old value still match? And if so, I do an ex uh, atomic exchange. I can do this with a high concurrency rate, it doesn't matter. If it fails, it returns false, I just retry, otherwise I return the new version. Pretty, pretty straightforward. It just uses some scan safe. Who knows any API in Java that can do that already? What is it? Sure, it's atomic long, atomic integer, whatever. Just a single problem. So in Hazelcast, we store record information, statistics. We have like 20, 30 statistics per record. Now imagine you have 5 million elements or 5 million records plus or multiplied by 30 different statistic values. How many elements or how many Java objects do you get? Way, way, way too much. There's a better API. Any idea? Anyone heard of that? Atomic long field updater? Ah, awesome. No, <laughs> no, that's not from Spring. That has at least two camel cases to less. Um, so the way it works is you create a volatile field. Uh, you create this, this field updater. You say, please work on this class. So in this case, it's a record class. Oh, and there's dot class missing. And you give it the name of, of the field it, it has to update. And please, please make sure you add some comment because the, J, uh, the, the IDEs are not able to figure out anymore that this field is actually updated, because everything internally does some magic. Apart from that, it works the same way. It just hides all this retry logic and retry magic. You just say increment and get. That's nice. And we just have one static field per record, or maybe like um, maybe 30, because we're updating 30 different fields. Uh, but we just have one static final instance. So that is actually a pretty good API. It just looks kind of weird. Um, oh, my battery is going low. Um, so there, the, the solution to that is uh, called var handle. Who knows method handles? Who, who worked with method handles in Java 8 already? OK. No? Not more people? OK. Method handles are a pretty simple, straightforward idea. You create 
a call or a call site, what is what they call, uh, what they call it, um, at runtime. So when you say in your in your source code, I want to call add and get, the JVM merges this into a call site. That is what the JVM works on. You can inline it, and perfectly that's all perfectly fine. For var uh, for method handles, the idea is the same. It's like reflection. I just don't have to generate code because the method handle itself is an internal call site to the JVM. So it looks like the same stuff as I would call it in my source code to the JVM. Very interesting thing, and it speeds up things a lot, at least in the latest JVM versions. Um, it was pretty slow in the beginning. So var handle is kind of the same thing. Whenever I have var handle access, it looks like I'm doing like a foo dot bar right in my source code. The JVM can't differ between those kinds of different calls anymore. And that's an interesting thing because it means that the JVM is completely free to rearrange it, to, to remove any kind of getters, whatever you have, the same way as you would write it in pure Java code. And you can generate those kind of things on the fly in your application. Um, very interesting for frameworks. Um, how do you get it? Method handles, you create a lookup object and you say kind of the same thing. I want um, the var handle for the record class, the version field, and please handle it as a long. That's it. And after that, you have a var handle, and it doesn't matter which kind of field I'm updating, as long as the types match, um, I can just put in everything. I have a very, very simple API to do these kind of things on the fly and very generically. Memory management. What, what do I do? I allocate eight bytes. I know eight bytes long, right? Kind of obvious. And I put in something. Um, oh, by the way, obviously I get the address back. If I allocate something, I get an address. Oh, you remember this word pointer? Um, and I put in a value. Obviously I have to give the address and same way I can retrieve this element. Why do I do those kinds of things? Um, in this case, it is native, pure memory. It is not Java heap. It is not a Java object. That means I'm going around everything that has to do with the garbage collector, minimizing garbage collection. I can do this with some API that is available. Um, I already said it, byte buffer uh, problem. It just allocates up to two gigabytes, and then it just stops, because all of the methods are like, uh, ints, so all the indexes are ints. Um, apart from that, it's actually a quite nice API, and there is plenty of users um, just chunking up the memory they allocate into two gigabyte slices. Fair enough. Um, and going back to the var handles, we have a very interesting second option now. You see, it's still a var handle, but we can say here we have some memory allocated, eight bytes, and please make it look like a long array. So internally, this var handle logic will, whatever I put into this eight byte, it will automatically transform it into a Java long. It could be negative, it could be positive, you don't know. It just takes eight bytes and, allocate, uh, and, and handles them as a long. Obviously, in this case, I just get a single instance or a single element because I just have eight bytes. So I, if I try to put something on index one, it probably fails. The other option is, and that is where it is interesting. Normally, um, for the easy things, you can just use long arrays, right? Long arrays have a small problem, or arrays in general. What is the highest index for an array? Nobody? Max int. Perfect. Right. So if I create some among us space, or some huge amount of space, and I say handle it as a long array, I can use long indexes without any problem. That's one of the very, very interesting use cases about that. And there is one more thing, and that is very interesting, that is a scope. So you remember I just allocate something. I obviously have to free it. So who started with C++ or who worked with C++ and malloc and free? OK, so you guys know, right? You don't want memory leaks. Memory leaks, good old thing. Never happened in Java, right? We don't know memory leaks. 
So the problem is, if when you use uh, allocate memory or free memory, you have, or when you use allocate memory, you have to free it yourself. So the idea of a scope is having an auto closable, uh, auto -closable uh, scope where you can allocate uh, something, and in this case, make it look like a, it should be a long array though, um, and number of elements. And what we get back is like the best class in Java ever. It's called pointer. And there was one very nice public static final field in it. Uh, you remember the memory position zero? Right, so this very nice thingy inside of the pointer interface was called null pointer. They unfortunately removed it. Um, it was a great joke to have a null pointer finally in Java. Um, but so if, you, if you're coming from the C++ background, you have a pointer, and you, give the, you take the pointer, put an offset on top of that, and then you have to dereference it. It kind of feels familiar, right? And you get a reference, the second awesome class in Java. It, it is probably Java 10, though. And then you have your reference to any point, or in this case, to some index inside of this free allocated Array, uh, long array looking like interface. Weird, right? We can do memory or pointer chasing in Java, and we can do it on purpose. So with this reference, you actually reference one exact element in this long array, which is kind of interesting. Um, you just make, need to make sure that you obviously don't close it and, and give the reference somewhere else, right? If you, if you leave this scope, try with resource, that's something we use today, right? Try with resource? Yeah, OK, perfect. So obviously, whenever you, use, whenever you leave this scope of try with resource, the memory allocation will be inverted. OK, so I think we have to speed up. You, you just said 10 minutes, right? Oh, wow. Um, deserialization. Deserialization. If I speak too fast right now, um, just, just slow me down. Um, we magically deserialize somehow a char array, however that works. Um, in the best case, we just read it from a stream. Um, no, magic no magic here. Uh, we allocate a string instance using unsafe, uh, which doesn't call any kind of constructor. It just creates some magically string-like uh, string -like looking uh, memory position. Pretty cool. And then we just put in some, some chars. Why do we do that? Uh, there is a string constructor actually taking a char array. The problem is in Java, arrays are not immutable. So what happens is they take this char array you pass through, copy it, making a defensive copy just to make sure that the string, string immutability is not in danger. For our use case, does it look like we need this defensive copy? Do we do anything with the char array? No, we don't. So we try to solve this issue by not copying. I mean, if you have like a huge char array or a, a huge string, like a spring class name, you really don't want to copy this char array. By the way, it will break in Java 9, thanks to compressed spring, uh, strings, uh, which are stored in the byte array in different forms, with some magic header in front of it. Very interesting if you want to read on that. Um, uh, the solution is already there. Um, it is sun, sun reflect. Sun reflect reflection factory, I think. Uh, still some internal API, another internal API. But the idea is, and that is quite interesting, it is supposed to move to Java Lang reflect reflection factory. And it will create a constructor that doesn't do anything. It's generally just created for deserialization. Kind of obvious from the, from the method name. It's a very interesting thing. Um, who knows that? Jane I? Who hates it? Who loves it? The idea is clear. Um, we have some C++, C++ code. We just have to make sure it looks like a C call convention. Uh, there is some math, uh, name, naming convention. Uh, it has to be Java, uh, the class name, the method name, and some weird stuff. And that is how you interact from Java with C and C++. Uh, not very nice. You have to load the library, and you have to make this weird native calls. You've probably seen those public native something things already. Not a lot of people here, but I think you, you said you're, you used JNI. Did you like it? 
Oh, really? Wow, that's an uncommon way of saying it. <laughs> so there is one solution, which is called JNR, Java Native Runtime, uh, created by uh, Charles Nutter, the guy that uh, has this um, unsafe new constructor kind of thingy, or new instance kind of thing. Uh, JNR was created for JRuby. Um, and he created something which does all this magic for JNI on the fly and generates all this binding stuff in assembler in, inside of the JVM at runtime. So you just say, please, uh, you have an interface, uh, there's your method, get PID. You say, okay, please, implement, uh, j please create an implementation and bind it to this standard C library, which in, um, or to the C library, which in, in Linux is standard C. And then you can just call it. All this magic works internally. And it is so attractive that kind of the same thing is coming to Java. Uh, method handles again, but this time find native. Uh, we don't even have to tell them anymore that we want to have the C library. It just tries to figure out this call. Otherwise, if there are multiple calls in different libraries, you have to define it otherwise. Um, but it works kind of the same way. I say, OK, there is an int return type. So just do whatever you need to do to bind it to this uh, native call and make it happen. Um, we're skipping. <laughs> yeah, OK. Defensive copying. Uh, this is from Hazelcast source code. Um, we do it as well uh, because it's not possible. As I said, at the moment, arrays are not immutable. Um, who thinks that is one of the biggest problems in Java? Wow. What, what applications do you guys create? So immutable types. First thing, value types. Who heard of value types? OK, that's a nice number. Value types are, uh, as Brian Gutz, one of the language designers said, they work as, uh, they, they code like an object. They work as a primitive. The idea is you just have, or you have a point object, something that looks like a point object, and you work on the values directly. Obviously, because we don't really have a point class, uh, you have to create this object or this, this value differently. And the idea is that this point value class behaves like an int or a, a lowercase long. And the JVM is free to do all this nice um, optimizations on it that we know from primitive types. Uh, we have to speed up a bit. It looks like uh, that you get some stack allocation, um, generics. Uh, I think everybody knows generics, out of boxings, like the, the most favorite feature in Java, right? Um, we have to box it to an object type. Um, what comes up is the so called specialized generics, and people probably figured out there isn't any. Uh, I have to speed up, as I said. And the thing, what it does is it creates subclasses at runtime. And that means, or you can see it as some C++ template without the Turing completeness, which makes it easier. Um, so we actually get a box uh, subclass, which as a template applies this int uh, generic type to the method itself. So it, this uh, set t uh, is actually a set int element. So it will have all these nice primitives. And it solves this out-of-boxing uh, out magic in a lot of cases. Um, so that is actually all really true. Um, just quickly, um, long arrays uh, or long index arrays, um, shopping down arrays, uh, generic uh, arrays. What, what is currently happening if you try to make a generic array? The compiler tells you. Please don't do that. I can't check the generic type because it doesn't exist for arrays. Um, so that actually works. Um, and frozen arrays, immutable arrays. That is some kind of um, 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 some, some header change inside of the array. There's a new bit. Is this array frozen or not? And if you freeze it, nobody else can mute it, uh, mutate it anymore. Very interesting feature. Will solve a lot of the defensive copy uh, kind of problems. Um, we can skip the cleaner API. This is basically what works inside of the scope of the scope class, this auto cleaning magic. Um, obviously, uh, the, the slides are up uh, online. Uh, class dynamic, one of the weirdest things ever. Um, I mean, generic 
uh, specialized generics, I already said it looks like a template. Uh, class dynamic goes one step further and makes everything a template if you want to. So you, you can say, I want to have something like a synchronized map. So my template looks like method name, synchronized block, doing the underlying call. Or logging tracing is another very interesting kind of thing. Today, we solve those issues with AOP, aspect-oriented programming. It looks weird from the definition, but it actually has a couple of very interesting use cases. Um, yeah, I, I think I managed so far. So a lot of stuff is changing uh, inside of the language and inside of the JVM, mo probably most inside of the JVM. Um, a lot of this stuff is very highly speculative uh, because proposals change. So does this talk from time to time? Um, and the interesting features are not only for Java people. So who uses different languages? Kotlin, JRuby, um, Scala. There is plenty of Java uh, or JVM languages, and all of those guys certainly uh, have a need for, for a lot of features. The most important thing, if you haven't tried it yet, try Java 9. Very important thing. Um, download the e early access builds, and especially try the, uh, the module path. Try Jigsaw. It will probably solve, not solve your uh, application problems, but create some more. Um, and with that, I think that's the last quote. Perfect, Forrest Gump. So if you want to read about those kind of proposals that I just quickly walk down. Uh, there are quite a few. Um, and I think I don't have time for any question. <laughs> Just finished. OK, but feel free to, to ask afterwards. <laughs>